Does this sound good? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Is this good? All right. So yeah, welcome to Intro to Backend, and uh, yeah, let's get started. So first, for some logistics, um, this is CS 1998, Section 606. It's a two-credit pass-fail course. Um, if you've already passed the pretest and filled out the Google form, um, enroll directly in Student Center, and the course number is that thing over there. Um, and then make sure you're on the ed discussion. If you're not, just email us at that email address. All right, so this is going to be the structure of the class. Um, there's going to be a lecture on Monday, Wednesday um, from 7.30 to 8.20 in this room. Um, Mondays, we're going to try to do a lecture on like the actual content that you're learning. And then Wednesdays are going to be like finishing a demo. And sorry, on Mondays, we also start like a demo. And so lecture is basically going to be like an explanation of the content like regarding the course. And the demo is going to be like a live demonstration of the content uh, that you just learned. And at the end of every lecture, we're going to do a Kahoot to record attendance. Um, and if you miss a lecture for any reason, maybe like a prelim or just sickness, um, recordings of these lectures will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So you can have a chance to catch up in case, you know, you miss the lecture, or you want to review material. Um, yeah, and then all this information is also available on our course website. So definitely check that out if you have any logistical questions. So for assignments, we have weekly assignments that are released after Monday's class, and they're due the following Monday, except for this week at 11.59 p.m. You have six total slip days, and you can use this on any assignment you like, except Hack Challenge, which is like the final project of this class. So I'll go into Hack Challenge a little bit right now. Um, Hack Challenge is, again, the final project where you'll be collaborating with other students from the other app dev courses, like Intro to Back or Intro to Android, Intro to iOS. Um, and you're going to be building a usually fu a fully functional app. And these teams consist of usually three or four people um, with there being usually one person from each class and then an extra person from the intro to backend course because there's more people in backend than the other courses. Um, so yeah, as I said before, you're gonna be building an app from scratch from the ground up. And so since you're intro to backend, you're gonna be implementing the backend for the app that you're gonna do for your final project. Um, and I think it's a great way to have your first personal project. Um, when I took the class last year, I eventually put my Hack Challenge project on my resume. So um, it's definitely a great opportunity to like create something on your own, build something on your own. So yeah. And then you can use a maximum of three slip days per assignment. Um, so it's a minus one penalty per day after the slip days run out. So let's say you've used all your slip days and you sum submit an assignment late. Um, the max score you can get on that assignment is a 9 out of 10 because assignments are out of 10 points. All right. So this is the grading scheme right here. There are six assignments, each worth 10 points. Um, you've got Hack Challenge, which is 30 points. Uh, we've got Weekly Surveys, which are five points, and then Attendance, which is also five points for a total of 100. And then to pass, you need 70 points. So attendance is mandatory and I know it's like late at night and as someone who struggles to like come to class, even like in the morning or, you know, at 12 PM, um, it's hard to show up to a class this late, but we're going to try and make it fun this year. So the top five people who do well in the cahoots this semester will, will receive some fun prizes at the end of the semester. Um, one year, one of our course instructors bought, brought Legos from Japan and he gave them out as like prizes. Uh, I think one year some some people got speakers. So um, yeah, show up to class. All right. And then the textbook is also super useful. It can be found at this link on our website. Um, it has a lot of really useful information for the syllabus as well as assignment information. Um, when I took the class, I probably spent like 30 minutes to an hour just looking at the textbook every week just to like do the assignments. So I'd say it's very helpful. And then so about academic dishonesty, this is a Cornell course, so there's zero tolerance for like any cheating or anything like that. Um, you're going to want to follow Cornell, Cornell's ag academic integrity guidelines. Um, you're allowed to you're allowed to use um, or cite any code that's like not yours. Um, so if you like use any code in an assignment that like you didn't write, but you got it online, just cite it. 
Um, and then also talking amongst yourselves is fine. You know, discussing high level ideas is perfectly cool. Um, but anything like copy paste, like if you're copying someone else's code, that's not okay. I mean, you guys are college students, so you should probably know what's like okay, not okay in terms of Cornell's like AI, you know, policy. So yeah. And then if we find out about an AI violation, we'll automatically drop you from the course. And then you're going to have to deal with Walker White, who is the, um, who is the, what is he? Oh, he's the faculty advisor. And you're going to have to deal with him if you get an AI violation. And uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, so that's Walker White. And again, you're going to have to deal with him if you uh, get an AI violation. So for the course or overview, the first four topics are routes, databases, relational databases, and abstractions. Um, these are like the main four concepts for setting up a database and backend development. Um, and then we'll cover containerization, DevOps, and deployment and services. Um, and this is to this is basically how to let others use your backend. So like the first four topics are like how to create that backend, and then the next two topics are how to allow others to use that backend. Um, and then the last two topics are authentication and images. Authentication is going to be really important for Hack Challenge. So, um, yeah, make sure to show up to those last two. Yeah, so we're the course instructors this year. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. My name's Tony. I'm a sophomore in the College of Engineering studying CS and ORI. Um, I've been on AppDev for two semesters. I joined last spring, and this is my first semester teaching the course. And my name is Caduce. I'm just a CS major, and I've been on back after for a while, I think like two years. And this is also my first time teaching the course. Yeah, all right. So let's get started. So, oh, wait, yeah. Before we start, um, this is like any other class, and if I'm going too fast, just let me know. And don't be afraid to ask a question. If you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand, or you can come up to us right after lecture. Um, this is supposed to be very flexible in like any other course you've taken, so it's not designed to be you know super intimidating or anything like that. So yeah. And also, one more thing: we upload the slides onto the textbook, so if you guys want to follow along or download them, they'll be on there, and we'll be uploading that as we go along. All right. Yeah. So first for the client server model, does anyone know like what this is or like what this may be? Yeah. I mean, sure. If you want to. Yeah. 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 So yeah, along the lines of what he said, the client is like any computer, like a phone, laptop, tablet, et cetera, that you're using that runs the cold code locally. And then this interacts with the front end of an application. Um, and the front end is things that the user sees and interacts with, like the literal text, images, and the like button on like Instagram. Um, so the literal stuff of the UI that the user can interact with. So it's like the user interface. And the front end displays content and handles user interactions. So like liking something, viewing something, that's all like front end work. And so the server is also just like a computer and you can think of it as like a giant mega computer that runs backend code and handles the data of an application. So it's much larger, much more powerful, handles all the data. Um, and it's the centralized access to all information. So like. Let's say you're on YouTube and all the YouTube videos, all the YouTube videos and links, all of that information isn't stored on your phone. It's instead stored in a server and that server communicates with you, the client, to then provide the information for you to run your video, see the images and all the information you want to see. And this is why you're going to need Wi-Fi to access things like YouTube because not everything is stored in your computer and that'd be way too much information to store on your phone, right? So... The server is what saves all this data and you as the client communicate with that server through a network, which is the internet. So now we're gonna talk about client server communication. How do they communicate and interact with each other and how they communicate if they're two separate entities. 
So let's consider Google, right? We have google.com, which is a domain, and it's linked to an IP address, which is basically just like a bunch of letters and numbers that identify a specific domain. So we're going to start by looking through this URL. So first we have HTTP, and this stands for the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This defines message formatting and transmission standards, and it's used everywhere. Um, so there are different forms at the beginning of the URL, um, but in this class, we're just going to focus on HTTP um, and other examples like HTTPS. So www.google.com is the domain name, and the domain name is not equal to the server, and the domain name needs to be translated into an IP address. And again, the IP address is essentially like the unique combination of letters and numbers that represent the domain. Yeah. So let's say you want to look at google.com, but you don't know how. The client is then going to then go to the DNS, which stands for the domain name system. Um, the DNS is like a phone book for the internet because it stores all the IP addresses for the different domains you'd want to access. Um, so the client's so the client wants to go to Google, it's going to go through the DNS, then it's going to receive the IP address, and then it's going to go back to the client, where you're going to be able to search for Google.com using that IP address in this example. Okay, so now requests. Requests are things that are, again, initiated by the client. Um, and again, the client is a user, which is like the phone, tablet, and like all the other things that are used by the user. Um, the request is a network call over the internet. So suppose you want to like look at this video or you want to view th this text or view something, you need to request this information. The URL is used to indicate the request destination of like where you're trying to go or what you're trying to receive. Um, and then the method indicates the operation purpose. Um, we'll cover methods a little later on. And then the body contains any additional information from the client. So anything that may be useful for that request. So firstly, the request URL, it indicates the request destination and it's also called the endpoint. And these two names can be used interchangeably. Um, it defines a specific route path to hit. And a good way to visualize this is to think of like a route, like a function. It's like where you're trying to go. Um, you can integrate data into the URL so the information is already encoded into that path. And a part of this is the query parameters, which we're going to learn about later. Okay, so there are four main archetypes of operations. Um, and there's a little, I guess, acronym to remember these four. It's called CRUD. It's create, retrieve, update, and delete. This acronym can be used to remember the different purposes of these different request methods. So like create, you're trying to create something, retrieve, you're trying to get some information, update, you're trying to, cha you're trying to change something that already exists, and then delete, you're trying to delete something that already exists and it needs to be gone. So there's request methods that correspond to these four CRUD operations. So the the C in CRUD create corresponds to post. So you're trying to send information, which is like information transmission. Um, so for example, if you're trying to log into Instagram, you're going to send in your username and password. Um, for R, retrieve corresponds to get. So you're trying to retrieve some information in some form. And for example, you're trying to watch a YouTube video. You need to get that information from somewhere. The U in update corresponds to put and you're trying to revise some information. So like, let's say you want to change your Instagram username. Your Instagram username already exists, so you want to change it to something else. Um, and then delete is information removal. So if you would call this method, you would want to delete your Instagram account. There are other types of like request methods, but we're just going to be focusing on these main four in this class, post, get, put, and delete. And then REST full APIs typically conform to these methods. So REST APIs are essentially like a type of database that also conform and use these four main methods. So for the request body, um, there are standardized forms of data. I'm sure everyone's heard of um, forms of like plain text, HTML, JSON, and all of that. Um, in this class, we're gonna be using JSON form. 
So the request body contains information necessary for the desired operation. So for example, if you're like logging into Instagram, the request body is gonna be the username and the password for the login. If you wanna post something on Instagram, it's gonna be the image content for that media upload. Okay. And the request body is not the only piece of data attached to the request because there could be data in the URL itself, but it's the most useful. So like you can think of the request body as being like the main carrier for the data that you're trying to do with. So now we're gonna look at some example requests. So the first one is this get request. Um, so here we're doing the Google domain, which is in the <laughs> green over here. And then this, the slash search is the root path. And the query parameters is the key one equals value one with the, with the rest of the string in that form. So in this example, the key is equivalent to the letter Q and the value is equivalent to the word query. And if you're familiar with like hash maps in Java or like dictionaries in Python, it's basically the same thing where you have key value pairs like in this, in this form. So the next example is a post request. And so the slash login is the route path and the request body is in JSON form. Um, the key will be your username and the value is whatever value or string you put in there. So in this case, like your username is JS123. And then for the second part of the request body, um, your key will be password and then your password is whatever you have. So in this case, it's password, which is not very good, but it's besides the point. Um, yeah, and then for the request body in JSON format, you must have like double quotes around everything. I know in Python, like you can use single quotes and double quotes interchangeably, but in JSON, you have to have double quotes or else this is gonna cause a lot of problems in your code. So the response is triggered by the client request. So essentially your client is going to ask for something and the response is what's given in return from that server. It returns confirmation of the request operations and response codes are used to indicate success at an abstract level. So has anyone heard of like the error 404 not found? Yeah, so it's like a pretty common error um, it's a response code that indicates that whatever you're asking for, it's not there. So basically the response sends meaningful data in a body, just like the request. So like when you get error 404, you know that whatever you're asking for was not there. So again, the response codes indicate the status of like a requested resource and they're sent accompanying the response body. So like error 200 means success and everything is okay. And there's other response codes like 201, 202. So basically anything with a two in front basically means success and what you actually did worked. Um, and then error 404, which we just discussed, means whatever you were looking for wasn't found. And then error 500 is an internal server error. error and then this basically means that your database is very broken. All right, so now we're gonna look at some example responses. So this is a get request. And so we're trying to query, we're trying to search the Q equals query, I guess, part of the request. And the this example is what's being sent back. And so say you queried like a hundred of something. And so the count is a hundred. And then this will contain like the information that you're trying to get. So this result, I guess result variable is gonna contain whatever information you're trying to get. And then this has a response code of 200, meaning that your get request was in fact successful. Oops, sorry. This next one is a post request. And so we're trying to log into Google. And so since it was a, it was a success, you know that you put in the right username and the right password and you get the status code of 200. And, oh, and uh, success is true. So you know that what you intended to do actually worked and the data field is the relevant like data in the body of the response. 
So this next one is like a failed login attempt. So we have error 401. So you tried to log in, but you forgot your password and it didn't work. And so success is false since it didn't work. And the error is just a relevant error. All right. So to summarize, we have the client server model where the client is going to send a request to the server and you're trying to do something, you're trying to get whatever information, whether that be CRUD or you're trying to do something from the client to the server. So the client is going to send that request to the server. Um, the server is going to have the routes trigger from that server and then you're going to have some form of data operation. Um, so for example, let's say, let's say you're on the Uber app and you were a really bad passenger and the Uber driver decides to give you a bad rating. And then you're going to have a bad rating and your five-star rating is going to go down. So at this point, the data operations is a calculation of changing your five-star rating to let's say like a three-star rating. So the request would be a really bad score. And then you would calculate your new bad score and the data operation stage. And then the last point would be to return your response where the response is sent back to the client. Yeah. So I know I just covered a lot of information. So does anyone have any questions right now? Yeah. Um, like when you have those like books up there, how are we supposed to know whether it's like a, a get or a post like as of like or like you know, what Um it's usually like what you put in the uh, request body. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Rough time. Yeah. So the root path is like, I like to think of it as like a function. It's like where you're trying to go. That's like the best explanation I have for it. Uh, yeah. Like, no, it's just yeah. All right. Yeah. So yeah, so now for the pre-demo knowledge check. So documentation is super important, especially for Hack Challenge, where you'll be working with other people. And it's super important for you and others who use your code to be able to understand its functionalities. So like, essentially, let's say you wrote some code and you didn't document it, and then you come back to it a week later and you don't know what it means, or you don't know what you even wrote. So it's very important that you document the work that you're doing so that you and other people who are reading your code ultimately understand what you're doing and or what you're intending to do with that function. So like, for example, looking at this function, like without the commented line, you don't really know like the entire purpose of this function. So it can be pretty vague and could really mean anything. So the fact that you have this commented line of code, like tells you what this function is going to do and kind of highlights the importance of documentation. Yeah, so that being said, um, you want to avoid commenting code where, which is like self-explanatory or like not necessary. So for example, if you have this like data loaded constant, that's false. Like we understand that data loaded is like, you're checking if the data has been loaded. So like, if it's false, that I mean, it hasn't been loaded. So you don't really need to, I guess, document this part of the code since it's pretty self-explanatory. So like, yeah, so in this stop sign example, like if it's a case like this, then you don't wanna like document it. Um, but a good rule of thumb is if you don't immediately know what you're trying to do with the function, then um, then don't document it or, sorry. If you, if you do immediately, if you immediately know what you're intending to do with the function, then uh, you don't document it. The charge. No, it's good. Oh, yeah. I just can't work it at all. So debugging, um, debugging is the, I guess you guys know, it's the process of removing errors from your code and it's really annoying. Um, usually you're writing code about 10% of the time and debugging and debugging the rest of the, you know, 90% of the time. And it's going to be a big part of any coding class that you take. So it's very important that 
we'll be using Postman to debug our backend code, and we'll also demonstrate this later in the demo. So virtual environments, they create an isolated environment for Python projects. Um, different projects might require different frameworks or libraries or dependencies, and which, which as essentially tools that you can use along, which are essentially tools that you can use alongside your code. And virtual environments, they contain packages of specified versions and are useful when working on multiple projects. So let's say you're working on one project that uses Flask 2.0, and you're working on another project that requires Flask 1.0. And if you're using the wrong version of Flask on one of these projects, then this is gonna break your code or your code may not work as intended. So the virtual environment is basically a place where you have all the dependencies and tools that you're using for your project. So your project is able to work as intended. And it's very important that you activate and deactivate your environment as you use it. If you don't know what this is, um, just keep a note of it and be aware of it. And Caduce will show you what this means uh, in the demo. Yeah, so this week, um, the first assignment will be released. It's gonna be due the Wednesday after fall break. Um, and then, yeah, Caduce will give you a demo of the content that I just covered.